The Paranormal Podcast is brought to you by Gaia, the streaming TV service dedicated to exploring the cutting edge of metaphysics, ancient wisdom, and the unexplained. 5,000 years of wisdom on demand. Get your first month for only 99 cents. Visit Gaia.com slash Jim. That's Gaia.com slash Jim to see what's happening on the largest consciousness media streaming platform in the world. Thanks, Gaia. The Paranormal Podcast is also brought to you by Wink, my wine club of choice. Wink is offering our audience members who are 21 and over and who live in the U.S. a $25 credit plus free shipping on their first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. Go to trywink.com slash Jim. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash Jim. Or text Jim to 25829 to get the deal. Thanks, Wink. This is the Paranormal Podcast with Jim Harold. Welcome to the Paranormal Podcast. I am Jim Harold, and so glad to be with you once again. And boy, do we have a great show on tap. We're going to talk about UFOs today, specifically. The biggest UFO case ever, Roswell. Don Schmidt will be along to talk about his new book, Cover Up at Roswell, exposing the 70-year conspiracy to suppress the truth. And then we've got Ellen Tad taking it a totally different way. We're going to talk about The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on Earth. Well, I hope you're enjoying the shows. We love putting them out for you. If you enjoy the shows... Please go to jimherald.com slash subscribe. That's jimherald.com slash subscribe. There, whether you're on an iOS, iPhone type device or an Android device, you'll see the links where you can subscribe to this show and my other free podcast. So I hope that you'll do it. We thank you so much. And now on to the program. No case looms as large in the UFO lexicon as, yes, fill in the blank. You know what I'm going to say, Roswell. So uh, my interest was piqued when I saw this new book come across my desk, Cover Up at Roswell, Exposing the 70-Year Conspiracy to Suppress the Truth. And I was doubly interested when I saw the author, Don R. Schmidt. He is the best-selling co-author of Witness to Roswell. And Don is the former director of special investigations for the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. He's a co-founder of the International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell, New Mexico, where he serves as an advisor to the board of directors. He's a six-time best-selling co-author as well. His most famous title, Witness to Roswell, was the top-selling UFO book in the world in 2007 and 2008. It has been optioned by Stellar Productions for the feature film Magic Men. Don Schmidt, welcome to the program today. Oh, so good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll start out with a question I'm sure you've heard many times so far, and uh, I'll ask it again uh, at the risk of being repetitive. Why another book on Roswell? Well, we were approached by our editor considering that um, it is we've just approached the uh, 70th anniversary of the event, and I think more importantly that the cover-up still looms. It's still there. That uh, no matter what new explanation the, the government provides, it always pales in contrast to the, all the eyewitness testimony. Uh, we're presently up to four official explanations. I always joke that husbands should try that with their wives if they come home too late some night. <laughs> but yet the government... Uh, as a true insult, not only to all Americans, but sadly to all the, the witnesses now, you know, long past, uh, passed away, that uh, they, they still insult their testimony, their deathbed confessions, the fact that they served as good civilians, as uh, good citizens, good uh, soldiers, good military people, even the press who were threatened with loss of their licenses should they continue to report the truth. And that should alarm everyone. Even if we take the UFO out of the uh, equation, the fact that the United States government resorted to such, such extreme measures in suppressing this incident, and then now, as I've been mentioning, 70 years later, 
Even the presidents of the United States, such as Bill Clinton, the last time he was on uh, Jimmy Kimmel, he lamented the fact over and over again as they discussed Roswell that he had eight years in the Oval Office and he couldn't get them, whoever they, them are, to tell him the truth about Roswell. And so shouldn't that concern all of us? The fact that there's almost this secret government that is running things? It seems very odd. Now, one thing that interested me here when I saw the book was this idea of a a uh, more comprehensive timeline because to me that's some of the that's a lot of the confusion and why was you know some people said there was a delay in reporting it then you have the, the press release and you have the i believe it was the roswell daily record those huge headlines like they used to do in the old days about the flying disc and and then the retraction oh there was it was just a weather balloon um, what was wrong with the timeline we had in the past and, and what's new about the one that you've constructed well, as any legitimate investigation, it remains fluid that um, based on the uh, assimilation in the accumulation of the data and then as one determines based on corroborative eyewitness testimony in conjunction with the documentation, the press accounts, and uh, even the ancillary events that were taking place at that time, you you start to compile, you know, a chronology of events and in the past it's been mainly limited to the fact that we didn't have all of the raw data mm -hmm. that we had to insert a lot of speculation and as as uh, time has as uh, progressed we've been able to plug in all of this new information we essentially been assembling uh, putting together a puzzle and what's amazing is the lack of contradiction as any investigator, uh, any law enforcement officer would tell you, even any insurance adjuster would say, you have ten witnesses to anything. You have ten different versions, right. ten different accounts. And, and to me, and as we've even demonstrated this to investigators and even uh, crime investigators and insurance investigators and lawyers, they too are impressed by the fact that for the lack of contradiction and dispute amongst the witnesses, it continues to demonstrate the profound impact, the effect it had on all of these people, that this has remained etched in their memories for all time. And as a result, they describe this as though it happened yesterday. They describe essentially I saw this, I handled this, I observed this, I was witness to this, and we have found very little confabulation. We have found very little fabrication as a result because we can tell you who drove what truck and who drove what flatbed and who picked up what and who flew out what and who guarded what. And, the, again, the amazing thing is nobody is challenging anyone else. No, 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 I was at that hangar. Oh, no, 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 I was on that flight. No, 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 I was picking up, you know, debris. They, you know, almost down to a man, we can insert them. And as a result, we're able to put together this systematic timeline down to the minute as to what transpired. And it all flows. It all comes together. And I think above everything else, it demonstrates that whether the civilian, whether the military, they were all reacting the same way. First of all, out of fear and then confusion that they didn't know what they were dealing with, that this was something extraordinary, and they all behaved like human beings as though they were witnessing and then having to deal with something truly extraordinary. Now, in terms of this case, I can't think of, when you think of 70 years, that to me would make the trail very cold to new developments, new revelations in those kind of things. Now, it sounds like you did not find that to be the case at all. So talk to us about why maybe this cold case really wasn't so cold. Well, first of all, we had the original press release, matter of historic fact, on July 8th. 1947, the United States Army Air Corps announced to the world that they had captured a flying disc. 
and through the chorus of uh, those banner headlines, as you mentioned, that even went around the world, a lot of people were named. And these were witnesses that could be tracked, traced, and then interviewed. And then the follow-up explanation, the weather balloon, also provided documentation and eyewitness accounts. And we saw that it quickly fell off, that there were no witnesses to any weather balloon. There was nobody that ever has been uh, able to testify to that effect of any legitimacy. And as any investigator in, in dealing with initial witnesses, well, they lead to other names, other families. And we've been working on this for 28 years. And as I mentioned, for having talked to over 600 witnesses, either directly or indirectly involved, you, and, and, you accumulate a tremendous database. And, and from there, it has, has sprung off to other military officials and other investigations, uh, uh, such as the, the, Dr. Lincoln La Paz, the famous meteor expert, who came into Roswell two months after the incident with the assignment from Washington to investigate the speed and trajectory of this weather balloon, as if a balloon has speed and trajectory. And then the, the, the personnel who were assigned to assist him. And then we're learning more and more that um, Operation Paperclip, the Nazi scientists that were brought over here at the surrender of Germany after World War II, and unbeknownst to most Americans at that time, we, you know, we hid out the fact that we had all these German scientists. Well, now we're learning more and more through their families and witnesses who were in direct contact with these German scientists that they too were brought in the Roswell to examine the wreckage and with the hope of identifying this almost unearthly material as it appeared to them at that time. So you see how it then continues to branch off into uh, renewed efforts, renewed investigations, exploring other avenues of approach, and uh, the laboratories that were involved, Battelle Institute, Hughes Aircraft, Rand Corporation, Bureau of Standards, and then we find first 10 witnesses there who uh, were involved with the uh, attempts at reverse engineering the, the, the material. And then, uh, as we know the story, and f from even the press accounts at the time, that the wreckage was transported out of Roswell to Wright Field, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And then we found a growing number of first hand witnesses who were on the receiving end, who were there when the materials arrived. The late General Arthur Exxon, Colonel Robert Friend, who was one of the, he was the second last director of Project Blue Book, and other uh, military who were at Wright Field when the materials arrived. So you put together again this chain of custody, so to speak, and as a result, uh, it's been a 28-year investigation, and we are still making every final effort to track down every possible lead, every possible witness. And, and until we are able to come up with a final resolution as to what indeed did happen at Roswell 1947, we have no plans of um, you know, uh, discontinuing the effort. One thing that's fascinating to me is this idea that maybe even there's some confusion about where the actual crash site is. Uh, I, I mean, what did you find in that regard? Well, we've, we often encountered witnesses who we were quickly able to dispel, to um, disqualify as to their not only being there in 1947, but then certainly their testimony. And uh, it, it, it appeared to, uh, to us almost like standard fare within the military, that it was the, like the proverbial boy crying wolf that you muddy the waters with enough disinformation that it you know, creates this perpetual smoke screen over the actual you know, location, the true site. 
And if you were to go even to the press accounts back at that time, there were supposed crashes, you know, north of Roswell and west of Roswell and south of Roswell. And they actually named outside regions and towns like Carrizozo and Farmington and uh, Utica and, and, and so on. And as a result, you, you have to check out such stories but uh, we were always able to quickly dispatch them as uh, not even belonging in the gray file. They were totally discarded. But nonetheless, they received attention, and um, it, 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 did, it served the purpose of uh, essentially disqualifying any possible source, even, though, even if they should provide the, uh, the true site, the very... Uh, the very location that this all transpired. We've been able to determine with multiple first-hand witnesses the exact location of the debris field. There was a secondary body site two and a half miles from that debris field. And to date, we have had now five first-hand who have verified that location. And then the most important location, the impact site, 35 miles north of Roswell, along that same trajectory line, we now know within a few hundred feet where the impact site, where the remains of the craft and the crew were located. So I can honestly say to you as of uh, this interview that we now know precisely where the uh, crash sites, all in conjunction with one event, the different locations, um, the uh, part of that original mid-air explosion were uh, were involved, and uh, the the rest have been discarded. The rest um, are nothing more than uh, flights of fancy. People trying to at times, uh, um, as far as profit, and come up as far as with locations that they could create tours, and even build uh, facilities uh, as far as. Uh, just imagine we actually had to deal with with people who were trying to create a resort you just imagine you can spend time at the actual roswell ufo crash site um the actual locations are not tourist attractions at all uh, the the brief field has a stone monument in remembrance of the incident that is the only thing we have ever allowed to commemorate or provide tourists with a um, actual landmark that they could uh, actually uh, go to. So we have done everything we can not to make this into a tourist attraction. Now, I, I'm very interested about your point about disinformation because I think you use the phrase muddy the waters, and that's exactly, uh, you know, I think it with anything that the government doesn't want to fess up to. You know, if you have enough people out there saying enough different off the wall things, the general man and woman in the street are just going to say, oh, this is just a bunch of loonies, this is a bunch of BS, and there you have the uh, desired result. Now, here's a question for you. Do we, as um, believers, people that believe something happened in Roswell, do we play into it sometimes by going along with the silly factor and people dressing up like aliens and in and, and different kinds of festivities. And I think everybody should have a sense of humor and have fun. But do sometimes do we unknowingly play right into the hands of dis possible disinformation agents? Unfortunately, it still is the way of human nature, whether it's uh, Elvis Presley down at Graceland, even the Holy Land, that people always... You know, you can take any tragedy, any event, and how quickly vendors, how quickly people come in with the uh, no other intent than to exploit other human beings who are looking for souvenirs, for keepsakes, for something to say, I was there. And we have done, you know, all we can to prevent that, certainly, at the main sites involved. The debris field, for example, even the monument is a half a mile away overlooking that arroyo. And we keep people away from the debris field site because we still consider it an active archaeological site. 
We don't want people potentially contaminating, traipsing around and gawking and pointing. And to us, it's, it's sacred, almost like a battlefield, that if we believe that the event happened as we have laid it out, then people, if we can call them that out of due respect, died out there. And we should hardly make that into, you know, a site of uh, curiosity seekers and souvenir uh, keepers, that type of thing. But it was precisely for that reason, though, that we first approached the city father, fathers in Roswell, that we were concerned about this outside carnivalization of the incident. So we pushed for the, the establishment of the museum, for the historic preservation of the very event itself. And they have a gift shop, and sure, they, they provide uh, all types of uh, uh, paraphernalia for those sightseers, those souvenir uh, seekers, that type of thing. But they're not doing it at the crash site. They're not doing it where, you know, potentially beings from another planet met their, their, their fate back in 1947. So we can't. Uh, prevent people from still having an interest, still wanting a piece of history. That has always been human nature in, in, in full scope around the world. And for that matter, uh, I applaud that because they're also demonstrating that they, they are interested. They're supporters. They're, they aren't subscribing to the government you know, nonsense that this was a non-event, that this was something you know, of off-the-shelf material that they launched on a regular basis from Roswell. And uh, sorry, we fooled the most elite unit within the military back in 1947, the very people in charge of the atomic bomb, the 509th bomb wing. And uh, ha, 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 the laugh was on them. So here we are 70 years later, and the numbers only increase. The museum is coming off of its biggest year in its 25-year history. And the numbers already this year are surpassing last year. Souvenir hunters, yes, but defying the government's position, I think, is more important. The fact that they're coming to Roswell and saying, we don't believe the government. We believe this was something much more important. And I want to demonstrate that. I went to Roswell to place my vote to say, I believe it did happen. Our guest is Donald R. Schmidt. The book is Cover Up at Roswell, Exposing the 70-Year Conspiracy to Suppress the Truth. And we'll be back with more right after this. The Paranormal Podcast is brought to you by Gaia, the streaming TV service dedicated to exploring the cutting edge of metaphysics, ancient wisdom, the unexplained in the paranormal. And I'm going to tell you how you can get your first month for only 99 cents, but pst, don't tell anybody. Well, actually, tell everybody because Gaia is great. Not only does Gaia have fantastic original content that they curate, but you can watch Gaia on all of your devices. If you're listening to this show, there's no reason you can't watch Gaia. There's Apple TV. There's your Roku. That's the one I like. I'm a Roku person. Your iPhone, your iPad, your Chromecast, your Android device, your Fire TV, your computer. Again, if you're listening to me, you can watch Gaia at your own convenience. Now, we all know those big streaming services that have all the great movies and general entertainment TV series. And they're great. And, and I love them. But when I want to tune in to this meaty content by some of the greatest thinkers in the Fortean, I go to one place, and that is Gaia. Now, Gaia explores the topics we love and is always providing viewers with tremendous new content. Now, some of the things that you're missing this week, if you aren't tuned into Gaia, are things like Disclosure, the Lost Interviews, hosted by David Wilcock. And actually, the guest is Rupert Sheldrake, who is fantastic. I've spoken with him before. Very, very interesting guy, talking about the morphic field theory an entirely new look at consciousness and the universe we live in through his research into morphic fields sounds fascinating then we have we're talking about roswell today well we have another take on roswell by one of our favorite people one of the people i respect the most in 
all the field of the 40, and that's Nick Redfern. He's going to be sitting in with George Norrie. They're going to be talking about Redfern's alternative Roswell. Or maybe you want something a little more genteel. You could check out Open Minds by Regina Meredith. She's talking to Joan Walker this week, and they're talking about calling for angelic guidance. And there's so much more. You're absolutely going to love it. So what Gaia has done very kindly is they said, Jim, Pick out some content you think your people would be interested in, and we're going to let them check it out for free initially to to get a little bit of a taste. So go over to Gaia.com slash Jim. That's G-A-I-A dot com slash Jim. I've handpicked shows on UFOs, haunted places, and Bigfoot, to name a few that I thought you might like. But then I want you to check it out. You're going to love it. I know you will. Then I want you to sign up to what I call a video buffet for the topics we love. There'll be a little red button there. I want you to click on it. I want you to sign up. Uh, you can get your first month for only 99 cents. And they also have some great uh, deals, other great deals there you might want to consider. But that first month for 99 cents and try it out. You can dip a toe into the water. 99 cents. You've got that much in your couch cushions. So do it. Go to Gaia.com slash Jim. That's G-A-I-A dot com slash Jim to see what's happening on the largest consciousness media streaming platform in the world. Thanks, Gaia. We're back on the Paranormal Podcast. Our guest is Donald R. Schmidt. He is the author of the new book, Cover Up at Roswell, Exposing the 70-Year Conspiracy to Suppress the Truth. Donald, um... There are some people out there saying, hey, I believe something happened at Roswell. Maybe a weather balloon crash, maybe a secret uh, craft of some type, whether it be the United States. Even some people say it was from other, another country, maybe the Soviet Union, which I find just as incredible <laughs> as uh, as the idea of an alien spaceship. But uh, those people also might draw the line said bodies. There were no bodies recovered. There were no. What would you say in your viewpoint is the best evidence not only for a crash but for the existence of bodies well not only first-hand witnesses whether civilian or military let's look at the uh the situation involving the principal witness the ranch supervisor ww matt brazo now just imagine he's only handled unusual strange material metal plastic-like material that was paper thin that you couldn't cut or burn it uh, even a bullet couldn't penetrate it 16 pound sledgehammer wouldn't even scratch the material some of it had strange symbology that ran the lengths of these i-beam structures and silken strands of material you would hold up a light uh, a lighter up to one end and the light would emit out the opposing end well this was still 20 years before fiber optics and then what we refer to as our holy grail, the same paper-thin, nearly indestructible material. But this, you could wad up, you could crease, you could fold, and you place it down, and it would flow like water. It would smooth right out without any sign of damage. And you could le legitimately and realistically look back and say, you could convince such a witness that this was something top secret. This was ours. Please, Mr. Brazel, you have to keep quiet about this. You know, we, we, we were testing this. Thanks for finding, you know, this, this, this test on our part, but uh, now you're going to have to be quiet. Well, why would they then abduct him and hide him out at the, ran uh, at the base down in Roswell for five days? And... Then the talk starting to come out that uh, he was making comments like they weren't green and the poor unfortunate creatures and the stench, the smell was horrible. And then blurring into the phone, they weren't human to a reporter, Frank Joyce at radio station KGFL, that type of thing. Well, then his detainment for five days makes a lot more sense because he saw something that they could not explain away. They couldn't very well, very well claim. It was just a test gone awry on our part. And then you insert all the military witnesses, those who even were involved with a survivor, uh, 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 the sheriff, George Wilcox, whose family was aware of the fact that he talked about the bodies, the fireman, Dan Dwyer, who talked about witnessing the survivor out at the impact site 
just as the military moved in with uh, the recovery operation. And then the deathbed testimonies. We talked about them being admissible in a court of law. And invariably, every man who was involved back at that time, to their very deathbed, talks about the little men, the little people. And as one of the personnel at, at the base at that time said, they sure weren't from Texas. So <laughs> they, they, they knew exactly what they were dealing with. And that was where the, great, the largest cloak of, of, of secrecy was, uh, was installed. That it's one thing to talk about wreckage, but when you start talking about non-human bodies, and then even a survivor, all bets are off. That's where the military potentially could have lost all control of the situation. So that's where they really clamped down the hardest. And it's one of the reasons that these witnesses have been the most reluctant. They're the ones that uh, really had the fear of God instilled in them, talking about non-human bodies. A question that, that comes up um... I, I think about this a lot. Um, I'm approaching my 50s. That sounds scary to say. Not quite there, but I'm, I'm a couple of years away. But uh, when I was a kid, um, a little kid in the 70s, we had one telephone on the wall and had a dial, one of those big black Western <laughs> electric telephones. And, right. um, and now I have a phone that is like this miracle machine computer and all of this. And, and when I look at the rate of technological development from, say, the late 1940s, post-war, uh, post-World War II, till now, it is dizzying how quickly things like the integrated circuit, computer chips, all the different things that have enabled all these technological wonders. It just seems like they just sprung up. Whereas you had hundreds and thousands of years of human history where we had nothing approaching it. I mean, I would dare say that we've had more technological pros uh, progress from 1947 to the present day than we had in all of combined human history before. Now, it could be just there was a ton of military spending for the war and post-war and the Cold War. A lot of that has thrown off a lot of developments. Maybe that's it. Or maybe there's an X factor. Do you think Roswell could have been the beginning of an X factor of reverse engineering. I certainly, and there is documentation that it was the impetus for such an effort. Whether the results were a result of uh, that effort is debatable. But um, Wright Patterson, uh, for example, con uh, contracted the Patel Institute just down the road in Columbus, Ohio, to with the assignment of developing self healing metal. Well, that sounds like the memory uh, material I described just a few moments ago. And yet that was exactly what sprang out of, you know, right pat within weeks after Roswell. And I described the fiber optics as mentioned by the eyewitnesses. And you, you describe uh, you know, a chain of events that has accelerated post-World War II, and one could suggest that a lot of it was a result, you know, war is often described being the mother of invention, but nonetheless, we have not had another world war. Granted, there's been tremendous amount of spending with the military. Uh, it's sad to uh, see, see the the space program, we haven't really been anywhere. We haven't been to the moon in almost 50 years. And then all the talk of the secret space program. But who could hazard a guess where we will be in the next 50 years? If this only continues to accelerate, uh, will we even recognize the world in another half century? And, uh, and again, one can easily suggest that, well, it was because we had help. No different than the whole ancient astronaut, you know, theory that the ancient Egyptians and the Mayans and other cultures had assistance. They were provided, you know, with new technologies that then allowed them to accomplish many of the tremendous wonders of the world that even today are, you know, just beyond comprehension. So 
if I accept that Roswell indeed did happen, as I do, back in 1947. I know there has been every effort to reverse engineer the technology. And we may be exactly, you know, actually experiencing such breakthroughs even today, and we take it for granted, and it's there too. It's been from an outside uh, source. Now, this next question, I want to be careful how I ask it because I want to be fair to you as the author, and I'll let you kind of comment as much or as little as you want to. Uh, in this book, there's supposedly the Roswell smoking gun. What can you tell us about the Roswell smoking gun without <laughs> giving away the, 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 the big secret of the book? There was uh, a press conference going up a chain of command from Roswell, where they shifted all attention from the scene of the crime, so to speak. And that was the 8th Air Force at Carswell Army Airfield in Fort Worth, Texas. The base commander, Colonel William Blanche at Roswell, his boss was Brigadier General Roger Ramey. And Ramey had a press conference at his office late afternoon of July 8th. It was just within hours after that the initial press release went out with the admission of the capture of the flying disc. And Ramey explained this all the way as nothing more than a weather balloon with a radar reflector kite. And there were seven pictures taken of the press conference. And what's interesting is that there was only one reporter even allowed into the office, and that was a reporter from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, James Bond Johnson. And Johnson took four pictures, two with Ramey and his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas DeBose, and then two alone. And in the, those four pictures, Ramey is holding a teletype, a telex. Three of the pictures, it's the backside of the telex. In one of the shots, there is a full paragraph of text, visible. And you look at it and you go, my God, if we could only enlarge and enhance this, Maybe we could read it. And in 1990, we discovered that the negatives of those original pictures still existed. The newspaper took the pictures, and they were preserved at the Bettman uh, archives at uh, Arlington, Texas. Well, after we were able to acquire scans of that negative, we had, uh, like Dr. Richard Haynes from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who consulted with NASA, first attempt to um, read that paragraph of text. And he was only able to bring out a couple letters here and there. And as the programs have developed through the years, we've been able to go back to it. And our colleagues, Dr. David Rudiak, Dr. Donald Burleson, have been able to essentially read, decipher, put together the actual verbiage of that paragraph of teletype, and I can assure your listeners, it does not describe any balloon recovery. It is talking about something truly beyond a balloon and something clearly suggesting that there was more than just wreckage recovered at the, at the, uh, at the scene of the, of the crash. And that's where we talk about this being a smoking gun, because if this can just... Um, finally be deciphered and read to the point that the average person with the naked eye will be able to read this. It will leave absolutely no doubt that there was a crash of a craft of unknown origin, that there was a crew involved, there were bodies involved, and that this was covered up. And it would once again place the onus back on the government. And that's another reason that we are still working on Roswell diligently with no, as far as reverse course, we plan on taking this as far as we can because we realize, as everyone should, that if Roswell is what the witnesses tell us it was, we're talking about the biggest story of the millennium. Very, very interesting. And the way that people find out about that they get the book cover up at roswell exposing the 70 year conspiracy to suppress the truth don where can people find the book at barnes and noble and certainly um, amazon books so i i thank you always i thank you for the uh, opportunity 
and uh, we are, are still we're planning another archaeological dig. We've had six to date. We are continuing to work on the Ramey Memo, as it has been called, and we will continue to still try to find every last witness before we run out of time with uh, the, the, the undertaker, so to speak. Again, the book is Cover Up at Roswell, Exposing the 70-Year Conspiracy to Suppress the Truth. If you're interested in Roswell, I would highly recommend it. Don Schmidt, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I truly appreciate it. Fascinating stuff on Roswell. You know, there's so much written out there, but uh, this seems to be a new approach by Don Schmidt, so check it out. Next up after this will be Ellen Tad on The Infinite View. The Paranormal Podcast is brought to you by Wink, my wine club of choice. Wink is offering our audience members who are over 21 and who live in the U.S. a $25 credit plus free shipping on their first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. I got to tell you, and I've said this before, and this is the God's honest truth. <laughs> I used to stay away from wine because I think I was kind of scarred. Early on, when I started in the work world, I, I worked at this highfalutin classical station. Actually, I loved working there. But anyway, I would go to these wine parties with these much older and much richer people, and they would have wine, and they'd be going, oh, nice legs, nice legs. And I was totally turned off. I thought, wine is not for me. It's for snobby people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for a couple decades, I barely drank wine. And then I found out about Wink, and I probably had more wine in the last two or three years than I've had my whole life put together, uh, honestly, and I love Wink. Now, that's spelled W-I-N-C, and they are a wine club targeting a new generation of wine drinkers like me who want to do away with all that pretense and simply enjoy reasonably priced wine. Now, Wink Wink custom tailors wine to the taste of you and delivers three bottles of wine each month to your doorstep for $39 plus a flat $6 shipping rate. So when you start out, all you have to do is visit Wink and where you want to go is trywink.com slash Jim. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash Jim and take their 20 second palette profile quiz to get instant wine recommendations based on your unique profile. Now, the price point for most wines is $13. So by signing up and taking a, uh, advantage of this uh, offer, you know, $25 credit, that's going to get you some significant, significant wine. <laughs> You're going to love it. Uh, we just had, I believe, was Atavist. The other night we had a uh, little campfire, our own little campfire in the backyard with some friends, and we had a bottle of Atavist, I believe was the name of it. I really enjoy Wink. I think you will, too. Now, there's two ways to receive this $25 credit and free shipping on four bottles of wine on your first order. There's two ways to do it. Trywink.com slash Jim. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash Jim. Or even easier, they've rolled out a new way specifically for us. All you have to do is text my name, Jim, J-I-M, nothing else, no last name, Jim, to this number, 25829. Again, text Jim to 25829 for the same offer. And it is a great deal. You know, I love Wink. I look forward to my shipments. I enjoy wine now, whereas before it was kind of like, eh, it's not for me. But it is for me. It's for everybody who enjoys a nice, responsible drink with dinner or with friends or around your own campfire. Check it out. Text Jim to 25829 to get that special deal. Thanks, Wink. Our guest today is Ellen Tad, and we're looking forward to this because she has a new book out. It's called The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on Earth, and I know that we certainly need that. There's so much tumult to these days and uh, so much uh, angst, and I think it's a particularly good time uh, for this type of message. Ellen Tad is an internationally known clairvoyant counselor and educator who has been teaching and counseling for more than 40 years. She is widely respected for the integrity of her work, the accuracy of her perceptions and guidance, and the clarity and usefulness of her teaching. 
Ellen has lectured and taught across the country at colleges, universities, hospitals, and community groups. She's the author of two other books, The Wisdom of the Chakras and Death and Letting Go, which appeared on the Boston Globe bestseller list. Ellen, Ted, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. So when I look at this book the first time I saw it, uh, my first question is, well, I wonder what the infinite view is. Now, I'm sure that there's a big answer to that, but uh, what is what is kind of the thumbnail of what the infinite view is? Well, to me, the infinite view is the spiritual perspective that um, from my experience, uh, we're all spirit temporarily on the earth and that the infinite view is expanding our perceptions beyond just a material world perspective into recognizing that there are other realms and other dimensions that are part of life. Now, in the book, you started off with the journey to your guides. Talk to us uh, about your guides, because maybe to someone who is not steeped in, in metaphysics or the spiritual the idea of having guides is maybe kind of a, a little bit foreign to them. Talk to us about having guides and, and about your guides. Yes. Well, you know, as a child, I had experiences where I saw faces in the dark and I was afraid. I was raised by my father, who was a physicist, and I grew up in a scientifically oriented family. He basically felt I had a vivid imagination. And so I pushed these experiences away. But the watershed event which helped me to open was that my mother came back and talked to me after she died. And this changed everything for me. Um, at the beginning of my book, I say my mother gave me birth and my mother gave me rebirth because after that experience, I stopped fighting a clairvoyance that I had as a child. And I started to see beings again who existed in an etheric form. So um, everyone has guides. Um, beings in the etheric form look like us, except that their um, energy moves faster. We all know that in, you know, high school, junior high school biology, that our arms are not solid. They're energy in motion. Mm -hmm. And the um, etheric body is energy in motion as well. It's just faster moving. So um, when I allowed myself to open to this sensitivity, my first experience was uh, with an Asian being, an Asian man who appeared to me at 3 o'clock in the morning. And after that, I started having more visitations. And the way that they communicated sometimes was with thought, sometimes uh, with vision. Um, I certainly didn't expect that this was going to be my life's path, but I'm, I'm so glad because I feel that when, when we open to a broader spiritual perspective of life, then it has deeper meaning. It seems to me that today we're very much focused on the materialistic, whether you mean, whether when you say that you mean material things or possessions, or you mean um, a human, for example, is just basically the, the hardware that we see. It's the gray matter, it's the brain, it's the body, and really there's nothing else. But I, I mean, in this book, in, in your work, um, you can't uh, dismiss uh, or under undervalue the importance of the soul in the spirit. Um, why do you think we've lost connection to that in, in today's world? Well, what we focus on is what we see. You know, I learned this when I was in the process of designing a house, and when I was figuring out window placement, when I drove by houses, I only saw windows. And when I was figuring out how wide the chimney should be, I only saw chimneys. And I realized that our cultural conditioning teaches us to perceive a certain way. Children are taught to see a cup, not, an, not the energy around a cup. Although I do believe that lots of children have experiences with so-called imaginary friends or 
seeing energy and it gets conditioned out of us as we grow up and as we go to school and what I have found with my students is if you teach them to look at that which is beyond the physical they do start to experience it in the book you tell an interesting story in in your third chapter the human condition about an incident where you felt betrayed by a friend and it kind of opened the floodgates as it were and i thought that was a fascinating anecdote and a fascinating story is that something you'd like to share with us yes absolutely uh, it was a very powerful experience for me. So this is a story um, that took place quite a long time ago. And at that time, I had a very close friend who um, decided that she was going to help build my reputation by telling um, a neighbor of mine who was a journalist all the intricacies of my life. And uh, she did this without my permission, and I learned about it uh, when I read the local newspaper, and it was a terrible shock. And I knew immediately what had happened because I knew my friend was spending a lot of time with this journalist. And so when she came to visit me, I confronted her and asked her if she did this, and, and I felt very hurt, and I started to cry. And in the process of crying, I started to have visions. And I make a distinction between inner visions and outer visions. Inner visions are visions that we see within our mind's eye versus externally. And the inner visions was like, um, you know, a movie. I just kept seeing a movie of, of the suffering that we as a humanity have experience down through the ages. Um, some examples are um, soldiers on a battlefield uh, at all different periods in history or the suffering of um, a mother who's lost uh, her child. Uh, we as a humanity have experienced a lot of suffering and this crying went on for two hours where the visions just kept coming for two hours. Uh, toward the end, I started to see visions of joy and visions when being human can be fun and creative and loving. But it left me feeling a tremendous amount of compassion for all of us. One of my favorite phrases is a plate of compassion all around. I believe that being human is not easy and it's important for us to recognize that in each other because I also see that we're spirit and as spirit we have enormous potential we're unlimited in the spiritual world we travel at the speed of thought we communicate in thought and the process of being in the body is a very humbling experience here's a question for you um and I will say I'm sure that I'm this way, and I'm guessing many other people are. You, you think about yourself and other people, and, and I'm not at the evolved state that, that someone like you is spiritually and probably haven't spent enough time thinking about it. But when you do different things or come in conflict with people, you always kind of see it from your point of view. And you say, well, of course I'm right. Of, of course they're wrong. What they're saying is ridiculous, and what I'm saying is true. And even if you've feel you're a fairly empathetic person. I think we tend to kind of our default is I am right. You know, they're just not seeing, they're just not seeing it correctly. Now, how do we go out at, first of all, is that very common? I think it is. And secondly, how can we go outside of that and get more of a 360 degree view and kind of understand where the other person is coming from, maybe relate to them better and, and, and be able to build those bridges. How do we go about that? Well, my guides have been very much philosophers, and they pointed out to me early on that I should use the word conviction rather than truth, because they say it's very difficult to know what's true. And conviction is what we believe now. But as we learn, as we grow, our convictions evolve. So they emphasize that life in the material world is a school and we're all here learning. 
And if we have conviction and simultaneously openness, then the attitude that I know falls away and the attitude that replaces it is I'm learning. And therefore, you know, we may be 95% accurate and 5% off, you know. Um, so this combination of conviction and openness, I found for me, changed my tone because I didn't want to be arrogant. I wanted to continue to grow and learn and develop myself. But at the same time, I wanted to share knowledge and experiences that I've had that I thought could be helpful to others. You have a chapter here called Deep Focus, Activating the Third Eye. For those who may not be familiar, what is the third eye and why is it so important? Well, the third eye is a center in the chakra system. The word chakra means wheel in Sanskrit, and there are seven fundamental chakras that go from the top of the head to the base of the spine. And I became interested in the chakras because I wanted to understand human development more fully. I particularly wanted to understand people that seemed lopsided in their development, really adept in certain parts of their life and then very immature in other parts. And so I spent actually a couple decades just clairvoyantly watching people's chakras and I learned a lot. I wrote a little book about it called The Wisdom of the Chakras. It's all about my experience. And one of the most important things I learned was about the power of the third eye. So the third eye chakra is focused in the middle of the forehead. It's actually on the um, backside of our dollar bill, um, that image. And the third eye chakra is the center of wisdom. And what I found when I was watching people is that people have a tendency to live life focused in the gut or to stay in their analytical mind. And I found that the third eye is really key because it's a center of wisdom. And wisdom is very different than the intellect. There are a lot of educated people who aren't wise, and a lot of wise people who aren't educated. It's a different faculty. And what I learned was that the third eye is activated through focus and concentration. And the more deeply we can focus, the wiser we become, and the more we actualize our best. In sports, they actually call this the zone, which is when an athlete is um, really performing uh, their best, but in the midst of that, they're unattached to whether they win or not. So I have a chapter where I talk people through what I call the TAD technique, which is the comparison of perception between the gut and the third eye. And my guides have said, when you open two eyes, open three because the physical eyes show you the physical world, the third eye in the middle of the forehead gives you the spiritual perspective, and when you put it all together, you have integration. So try it. Have you tried it? I have not tried it. I have not tried it, so I've got to get on that right away. <laughs> well, it's, it's remarkable. You know, I didn't know this until my guides taught me, and I must say this technique changed my life. Well, we're going to talk about all of these things, which I think we probably all need to work on. The book is The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on Earth. Our guest is Ellen Tad. We'll be back right after this. Never miss a new episode. Go to jimherald.com slash subscribe and subscribe, whether you're Apple or Android, and never miss an episode. Now back to the show. Our guest today is Ellen Tad. The book is The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on Earth. Now, Alan, you talk in here about working with consciousness. Now, I, I love this. I'm not quite sure what it means, I, but I love the quote, consciousness is like a rubber band that can be stretched in all directions. Explain that to us. Well, our conscious awareness, how we perceive, is not just contained within our body. You know, I, I think it's very common for people to think that our consciousness resides in our brain, but I've had out-of-body experiences and my consciousness is not in my body, it exists outside my body. So 
let me give an example. So if someone walks in the room and we all turn, a whole group of people turn to look to see who's coming, we will all perceive that person to varying degrees. It's possible to project our consciousness, I think in, in scientific research they call this remote viewing, it's possible to stretch our consciousness in any number of directions and gather information. I can stretch my consciousness to where my daughter lives in Georgia and I can give you a sense of how she's doing today. So we all stretch our consciousness to varying degrees, but it's not a concept that's promoted in our culture. And I believe if it was, people would recognize that their ability to perceive is much greater than we've been taught it is. This next one I love because this is something I've long believed in and I'm interested in your perspective on it. Uh, it, it strikes me um, that when you meet people who are successful, uh, they're not they're not typically eors. They're not people who go, oh, you know, life is so awful and things are horrible and I've got to do this and I've got this problem and that problem. They're like, no, you know, things are great and yeah, maybe I've got some challenges, but I've got plans in place to meet those challenges. They just seem to be that kind of person with that kind of energy. So anytime I hear somebody talk about positivity, I want to hear what they have to say because. I really believe that makes a difference. Yes. A quote from my guide is positivity is our greatest protection because when we're positive, the aura actually gets much bigger because the positive attitudes creates light and this light protects us from getting overly affected by our environment. If it's negative, it also creates a positive influence in our environment and with those who are around us. My guides define positivity as attitudes based in spiritual principles. And they say attitudes are a combination of thoughts and feelings. So if someone says, how are you? And you say, great, but you really feel not so great, then that's not true positivity because what we're needing to do is align our feelings with our thoughts. And this is why the third eye is so helpful because the third eye brings us to this feeling of the glass is half full versus the glass is half empty without, without trying to. It, it, it seems that, um, and there's many proponents of this, but I think the things that, it's not the things, and this is a cliche, but I think it's true. It's not the things that that you face in life, the challenges. It's how you choose to confront them. For example, I had um, done a podcast for a short while, although I'm very proud of it. Didn't do very long, probably about 26 episodes, about people who had had physical challenges in their life and overcame them, people with MS or people paralyzed and, and different things that, you know, uh, you know, are pretty, pretty tough things to deal with. And yes. uh, there was this one young man and he made beautiful digital art, digital paintings. And he's literally paralyzed except for, I think, two or three fingers on his one hand. And he makes this striking art and he's very successful and he sells the art and so forth. And he just has a great spirit and, and that. And to me, I think if that young man can have that kind of spirit, after being dealt those kind of cards and say, hey, you know, this is what I've got to work with physically. I am going to get every ounce I can out of it and have a positive spirit. I mean, who am I, who I feel I'm relatively blessed, you know, who am I to complain about, you know, having to edit another show or whatever, fill in the blank. Who am I to complain? Um, there, there's old saying, a very old saying that I heard once. It's like, you know, I, if I complain, uh, I have no shoes, I might look Next to me, and there might be somebody there with no feet. So I, I guess my point is, is that um, I, I've always believed this. I don't know if I always practice it. And sometimes I get into that Eeyore state, as I call it. But I always try to pull myself out because uh, all in all, I think most of us are, are very blessed. Yes, and life is a series of attitudes. We can feel terrible and then wonderful and nothing has changed but the frame of our mind. 
So our perspective has an enormous impact on the quality of our life. And, you know, there's no question that there are challenges and some have greater challenges than others. I think what really motivated me to want to understand a spiritual perspective was the question, why? Why is it that one person is sick and one person is well and one person is poor and one person is rich? And this is where understanding reincarnation really helped me to see that there's an order and therefore a purpose to why our lives are as they are, no matter what challenges we have. Reincarnation is an interesting topic. So many people I talk to in the spiritual field uh, believe in it, feel that that is the process that we're going to. And there's almost, uh, with some people, I think, in kind of the metaphysical community, almost a consensus that that that's what we're undergoing. Why are, why are you so certain about that? I mean, what has convinced you? Well, very early on, um, I started to have memories of, you know, very, after my, my own spiritual awakening when I was 19, I started to have my own memories. But I also learned that I have an ability called hand scrying, which is reading the soul through the hand. And I've looked into large numbers of people's hands. And what happens is I start having visions of their previous lives. And I found through this process that the previous lives really do answer the question why a person has the lot in life this time. And so it's been an exploration. And so I feel very convinced. I also thought I was going to be a child psychologist before I had my spiritual awakening. And I had clairvoyant experiences with my children before they were born. So I believe in life before birth as well as life after death. And so I've been able through vision to see this continuation. So for me, it's, it's very much of a fact, but I understand that I didn't believe it until I had my own experiences. So I don't, I don't expect you know, I don't want to convince anybody, but I do teach skills in my classes that help people to have their own memories and their own experiences, because I think that's the best way to know. In the book, you talk about destiny and choice. Do you believe that we all have a destiny? Well, in the book, I write about the relationship between destiny and choice, that some people have more destiny in their life and other people have more choice. I call it a short leash life and a long leash life. So it, it varies from individual to individual depending on what our lessons are. You know, if there was only destiny, then we'd just be going for the ride. And if there was all choice, then the idea of creating your own reality is more understandable, except, of course, if people are trying to create different realities, then there's a conflict. So what my guides have taught me is there's an interplay between both, and that's what makes life so complex and interesting, which is the process of discerning where we actually can choose and where we simply must accept because it's beyond our, our choice. And so I always say that, that attunement and the use of the third eye and deep listening are the keys to knowing when we have to accept and when we should take charge. At the end of the book, you talk about perfection. Is that something that's attainable? I mean, is it something that is attainable over a series of lives? Is it something that's attainable? I would think it's not, you know, I don't think I'll ever be perfect. <laughs> Far from it. I mean, but in, in your view, in the, in the context you're talking about it, what do you mean by perfection, and, and can we hope to achieve it? So in that chapter, I talk about the difference between perfect and perfection, that perfect is an arrival that we won't achieve, and perfection is a process. So what my guides have taught me is perfection is the interconnected aspect of life. It's something that we can see readily in nature, 
the the order the um seasons when you plant a tomato seed you don't get a sunflower there's this incredible order that exists so they say that the perfection is the interconnected learning process that in my interview with you i'm learning and you're learning we're both learning so they they use the word perfection to help people get away from trying to be perfect because they say don't be so focused on the goal instead focus on the process now i when i'm dealing with someone with a metaphysical point of view and, and kind of spiritual point of view i always like to ask this question so it's a little bit of for listeners it's a little bit of a repetition but i think it's important particularly when you're talking uh two people and, and with an audience and, and some people may not be attuned to the, the spiritual ways of thinking. Some people may say, Ellen, this sounds great. You know, I, I would love to, 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 to think deeply and, and get in touch with all of this, but boy, I, I'm so busy. I mean, I've got to, I've got two or three kids. I got to get them to school. I got to get to work. I've got to pay the bills, all these practical concerns. I mean, how in the world can I make time and how would I even start to, to walk down this path? What would you say to them? Well, the majority of my training or the real intensive period in my training was um, when my children were young and I was actually going through a divorce at the time. I had two small children. I was trying to build a career and I was in the process of, of contracting a house. So this was when I got trained and all the tools in my book can be integrated into daily life except meditation, which is taking a little time out to meditate. But I'm a big proponent of tools that you integrate while you're making dinner, while you're at work, because to me, uh, What's important is taking spirituality out of the monastery into the practical everyday life. So, um, so really, if um, people practice the tools, I think what they'll find is that their quality of life is better and the ability to discern priorities helps people to work, work smart instead of just working hard. Well, Ellen, uh, fascinating discussion, fascinating topic, The Infinite View, A Guidebook for Life on Earth. Let me ask you these two questions. If, if people are listening and they want to either get the book, and uh, we're recording this slightly before it's coming out, but, 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 but by the time you hear this, it will be out. Where can they find the book? And also, more information about all of your work. So my website is Ellen Tad. T A D D two D's dot com. So people can learn about my work from my website. And uh, the Infinite View will be available online in bookstores um, where where books are sold. So um, so I think it'll be easy to find. Indeed it should be. The book is The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on Earth. Our guest today has been Ellen Tad. Ellen, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that edition of the Paranormal Podcast as much as I did, and I hope that you'll come back. One way to make sure that you never miss a free episode is to go over to jimherald.com slash subscribe, and that way you can click on one of those links. You can subscribe, whether you're an Apple person or an Android person, and you'll never miss an episode. And again, the page to go to for that is jimherald.com slash subscribe we thank you for tuning in we'll talk to you next time on the paranormal podcast have a great week everybody bye-bye now for the legal disclaimer we do not accept money from publishers or content producers in exchange for interviews. However, as with most media outlets, in the majority of cases, we do receive complimentary copies of books and DVDs that we feature on our podcasts. Your purchases of books, DVDs, and other items via our Amazon.com links benefit Jim Harold and JimHerald.com and help us continue our programming.
The sponsor messages you hear on the programs are paid endorsements, although we really do like them. For the full disclaimer, go to jimherald.com and thanks for listening.